would like to welcome our next speaker, who's Ingrid from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. She's a co-executive director. Please welcome Ingrid. Hi there. And I said Ingrid because I don't know how to pronounce your surname. Edstein. Pardon? Edstein. Okay, thank you thank very you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, I'm delighted to be here today to share the perspective of lifestyle medicine providers who have really embraced wellness within the health system and in their own practices. I really wanted to just get straight to it right from the beginning and show the slide that encapsulates that lifestyle medicine kills. We learned this in the first day of medical school. It kills return business. And that's exactly why we're here today, because our current health system focused on reactive, acute-based medicine is not set up for wellness. It's not set up for a consumer-driven revolution. So I wanted to share the perspective of those who have seen ahead, seen forward, and have embraced wellness, lifestyle, preventive medicine in their own practices. So first, just to back up a little bit and describe what is lifestyle medicine. It's quite simple. It's using lifestyle interventions in the treatment and prevention of lifestyle-related diseases. It includes providing guidelines and guidance, prescribing lifestyle change as the first-line treatment. It's really the foundation of health. And that includes coaching, coaching patients through change. It's only partially in that office visit where lifestyle medicine happens. It's really the wraparound services and coaching patients through the lifestyle transformation that makes the core of what lifestyle medicine entails. So we all know what it includes, nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress management, avoiding substance use, and warm, connected social relationships. And we know that the evidence overwhelmingly supports the efficacy of lifestyle medicine. We know it works for nutrition, for physical activity, and back in 2010, the Journal of the American Medical Association had published uh, physician competencies for prescribing lifestyle medicine. So this has been around for more than a decade and has been established as the evidence-based resource for incorporating wellness into clinical practice. And we also really know that intensive therapeutic lifestyle change programs <clears throat> really work well. So in the clinical encounters, you might have a few minutes to discuss lifestyle. And then programs like Pritikin in Florida, where you can have a residential immersion, really enable that transformation to happen on a faster, larger scale. Programs like Ornish for cardiac rehabilitation have been around for a long time. It took 17 years for him to get reimbursement through Medicare for his program. There's also the Complete Health Improvement Program, which has been around for a couple of decades and has shown amazing results in just 30 days for body mass, blood pressure, cholesterol, triglycerides, and blood sugar, all those metrics that we're looking for for chronic disease prevention and management. And the outcomes last for 18 months. So really, in a nutshell, lifestyle change is the first-line therapy. It's the foundation of medicine. It applies for primary care and specialty care alike. And uh, the core aspect of it is that it involves active participation of patients. It's the flip of the model of the traditional physician-patient encounter. However, it's, uh, I don't know if this was discussed earlier, but only 3% of our healthcare spending is actually going toward this for public health and prevention, while we know that three quarters of disease are preventable. And as we mentioned, it's a fee-for-service system that's really not financially aligned to help us be successful in embedding wellness in our practice models. And in this transition to a fee-for-value system where we really have the most hope to implement lifestyle medicine at scale. As the incentives change, there's much more of an interest to embed wellness in our clinical encounters and within the operational structure of the health system. Hopefully, um, this will continue onwards. Some places have been early adopters. Where I worked uh, during my preventive medicine residency at Griffin Hospital, they changed their name to Griffin Health. I think that is a signal of what's happening. We developed a prevention and lifestyle management program that includes a lifestyle medicine um, 12-week intervention. And we did include a wearable device that was tracked. Uh, other places like Lee Health in Florida have also implemented lifestyle medicine wellness programming, Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. And then two unique centers like Cleveland Clinic and Akron General in Ohio 
in the Summit Medical Fitness Center in Kalispell, Montana, they actually have a medical fitness center right on site with the hospital so that there can be a continuous stream of uh, information and the patient experience between the medicine, the fitness, and the wellness from the hospital to the community to the programming that can help embrace lifestyle medicine and practice. So we've also been lucky to have, through the ACA, the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which brings in about $1 billion of funding annually, starting from 2010, hopefully till 2022, because they saw the ROI for prevention. A $3 billion investment, five years down the road, brings in $16 billion back. And this is through preventive measures in the community and in the clinical process. Things like smoking and health, heart disease and stroke prevention, and diabetes prevention. On this last one, I really wanted to describe this really grand um, victory, I would say, for preventive and lifestyle medicine that happened this past year. And this is the first time that Medicare, starting January of 2018, will begin reimbursing for the Diabetes Prevention Program, which is a lifestyle medicine program. It's about nutrition, it's about community, it's about uh, building in all those healthy lifestyles to prevent diabetes from ever happening. So we had Amada Health here to describe their program, and they've really been ahead of the curve in implementing this uh, with employers and hopefully soon nationally. And others have really jumped into this space because they do reimburse for digital programs as well. Healthcare 2017, not sure what that's going to look like yet. Everyone's a bit uncertain, but we're hoping that funding will continue for the, um, the ACA, the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Hopefully employer wellness programs will also continue. Uh, and ultimately though, it goes back to why we're here, that this is a consumer driven wellness revolution. Whether it's the health system, whether it's employers, it's really about engaging ourselves as patients, as consumers, and embracing the wellness concept as to who we are and what we want. So just some insights on consumer engagement for health and wellness from a consulting company in New York City. We can see that those with chronic disease visit their physicians between two to four times a year on average, a little bit more, a little bit less for others. And that there's this opportunity, therefore, to have the physician as a trusted provider involved in this wellness intervention. Uh, there is some interest uh, broadly in U.S. households for having the physician or a nurse remotely collect the vitals, have that information come back and be part of the care plan, and then integrating a personal health coach into this experience to help provide those wraparound services. It's about, you know, it looks like 14, 15 percent. And here I think is where we have some really good insights. Um, for those with chronic diseases, particularly with multiple chronic diseases, Having an insurer recommend a program, not so much, not too much interest in it. Um, having devices that are more convenient, more features, that looks great. What it looks like there's the most interest in so far, at least in a third of these uh, patients, is that they would like the doctor to recommend a program. There's an abundance of health, wellness, and fitness apps. Which ones do I go to? It would be nice to have the physician be knowledgeable about evidence-based digital health programs that they can actually recommend as part of the continuation of services in lifestyle medicine. So this is why I'm here today, to describe the work of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We're a national nonprofit professional society, more than 1,000 members, and we've been dedicated to preventing and reversing lifestyle-related diseases since 2004. Our motto is sustainable health and sustainable healthcare. We know it works. Let's make it the foundation of our healthcare system. So we uh, have physicians who are part of large health systems like Kaiser, Loma Linda University, Mayo Clinic, and Duke University. And we also have physicians who are in private practice, uh, such as Lifestyle Medicine Solutions in California, Wellbeing MD in Chicago, Princeton Lifestyle Medicine in New Jersey, Ken Center for Life in Florida, and my own practice in New York City. So the exciting thing is, is that it's not just a national movement, it's a global movement. In the past year, we've had about a dozen societies come up internationally. These include places, Asia, Australasia, Canada, Europe, and we just this past week, we had an inquiry from Singapore to start a lifestyle medicine society. So the interest is really growing internationally as well to embed this type of concept within the health system. And this is where I think the, uh, the synergy lies. 
in helping to educate the providers and the patients, because this is something that they're looking for. They would like to know what are those tools out there, which ones are evidence-based, what can I include in my practice, what can I include in my two to three minutes at least uh, to reinforce the impact of being an active participant in your care. And here's the next step, here's the continuum of care. As a patient, I want the convenience. I don't want to be stuck in an annual contract. I don't want to have to commit from day one. I want the flexibility in this digital health solution. From the health system, obviously, the benefits are tremendous. That's why we have the Prevention and Public Health Fund, because they saw the cost savings in these efficient solutions. So ultimately, the goal here from multiple levels, whether it's from the patient, the provider, the health system, I think we're leading to this precision population wellness concept of identifying what works best for the individual person at the right time, the right place, the right situation. There's an abundance, it sounds like, so far over the past day and a half of different assessment technologies within digital health, all of the different labs, all of the different wearables. How can we identify what works best for that individual patient without throwing everything in the kitchen sink, which is kind of what we're doing right now with lifestyle medicine, with programs like CHIP and Ornish. We throw everything at them because we know it all works, but can we be a little bit more sophisticated in our prescriptions? Can we identify what works best for this patient? And so we definitely have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, this study done by the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2005 looked at Americans who had all four healthy lifestyle behaviors, not smoking, having a healthy weight, five fruits and vegetables per day, and regular physical activity. I'll bring it out to the audience. Perhaps you've heard of the study. Any takers as to the percentage? You can shout it out. 2005. So I had 10 to 0.7, so it was 3%. And then, yes, there was another study done recently uh, by the Mayo Clinic, similar four healthy behaviors, um, body fat, mouth smoking, healthy diet, regular physical activity, any changes in the past decade, any takers? Did we improve as a nation? Sadly, that answer that was shouted out of 2.7 is correct. So we have a, a long way to go to really embed wellness in our health system, in our own lives, as providers, as patients. So I look forward to exploring collaborations with the digital health uh, companies here and other really uh, inspiring thinkers and, and speakers. Um, I hope together we can crunch all those big data numbers and come up with some really exciting solutions to embed wellness worldwide. Please feel welcome to contact me. I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ingrid, uh, for leaving two minutes for questions. And I'll steal the first one. Sure. Do you think the, it's the role of the physician or uh, some institution to change our lifestyle? It's, it just seems archaic to me, but maybe I'm unfairly picking on, on your domain coming from a computer science angle. Like, why do we need a, a, a person? It's obviously not happening. It's not going to happen, I would contend. If 2.7, when's it going to become four or five? Even that's nothing. It's just not happening. Right. That's the good. doctor's not changing your behavior. The hospital's not changing your behavior. It's never, they're not going to change your behavior. That's definitely been the failure of the health system because wellness prevention lifestyle has simply not been embedded in either the consultations or in the follow-ups and the continuity of care. You go see your doctor, most people get their um, prescription to eat more vegetables, go exercise, and do, go do some meditation, but then there are no resources in the environment. Um, you're very lucky to be able to encounter a, a health coach or a nurse who can actually assist you in this process to identify what's available in your community for that next step. So I think absolutely that was the core message of lifestyle medicine. It's about engaging the relationship with a patient and then activating them to be involved in their own care. I do think there is a tremendous opportunity for providers who, ha who understand the benefits of wellness, both for themselves and society as a whole to elevate our uh, self-actualization and to use that encounter to have that trusted relationship and provide evidence-based resources because there is really an abundance of different solutions for wellness and so having at least someone who you have a relationship with uh, recommend and really make this an imperative and to 
switch the thinking. Instead of medication for surgery second, have lifestyle as medicine as the foundation of your health and medications are the supplement and the second choice. I think that can have a powerful impact and potentially the integration as well with who's doing all this data tracking. We have the, the Fitbit steps coming in. I was running this program called Wellness for Life and everyone had a Fitbit and thank goodness we had an exercise physiologist to help us in that, but creating that feedback loop so that it becomes meaningful information and to engage patients further. So I think with the transition to a value-based system that will enable patients to be more involved and actually have wellness embedded within health. I just have to follow on slightly. Thank you for that elaborate answer, and I will go to the audience just after this point. I followed government advice, and I got sick. I got extremely obese, BMI 30, bad blood markers. I didn't, I didn't care about health. I just followed government advice, you know, eat cereals, blah, 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 eat five times a day. I got um, obese and I, I felt rubbish. And then what happened was I went and started getting blood measurements done. And then I started looking at the data and I, I didn't care about health at this point, but I started looking at the data and I started looking at what I eat. And then I realized that the whole food pyramid was upside down. I, the, the food pyramid I'd been given, I was high carb. Mm -hmm. I switched to high fat, the weight came off, my bloods went back. So, you know, I've been kind of anti-institutional since because this is why I was, you know, I went to physicians who said, who specifically told me eat this, eat that, and it, it just was not for me, clearly. So. I became terribly skeptical. Do you have any comment on that yes. before I do go to the audience? Sure. I think that goes back to this kind of holy grail of precision population wellness, of being able to identify for the individual what nutrition plan works best for them, how much activity should they be doing. Right now we have generic general guidelines, and there has been a lot of controversy as to nutrition and food policy as to what gets recommended. And we've stepped in here as an organization. We just came out with our 30 hours of online curriculum to help address this problem of the fact that physicians are not trained in nutrition, we have no clue about exercise, and forget about sleep and stress management. We are the wrong people to go to. So that's why we have um, really made an effort to help educate our own providers to be able to avoid the situations. Um, so I hope that's going to be uh, okay. avoiding the outcomes that uh, you had to suffer through. Do we have a question from the audience? No questions, uh, uh, the gentleman, Michael. I thank you very much for your talk. You mentioned that there was a place where you could go for maybe 30 days to mm -hmm. kind of have a reboot. And I think you mentioned after 18 months that mm -hmm. that's how long it lasted. Is that because they go back to their regular lifestyle? I was just curious to hear what happens in those 18 months and if there'd be any other approach you'd recommend. Sure, that uh, was referencing the CHIP program and the outcomes 18 months afterwards. So that was not the residential program. CHIP is a group-based uh, nutrition, primarily transformation program that's done in different settings, churches, clinics, um, um, residential. Uh, Pritikin does have a lot of research as well as CHIP as to their long-term outcomes. And I can go ahead and share that with you as references. But that was primarily for the CHIP program. Thank you, Chris. Yeah.